Good afternoon, everybody. This is Mike Talbot, and I'm very pleased to be here with you this afternoon for our webinar on becoming a mediator. I'm a psychotherapist by trade, and I'm the founder and CEO of UK Mediation. We started May 99, so this is our 18th year um, of working with all sorts of disputes, building dialogue within organisations, resolving workplace disputes. Um, we work with neighbours, we work with commercial disputes. I personally do a lot of business mediation, UK and overseas. Getting people talking wherever there's conflict, wherever there are disputes that we want to keep out of formal processes, out of court and out of the tribunal. So that's what we do, that's who I am. Um, and what I'm going to do is to begin to tell you about what's involved with becoming a mediator. So I know that a few of the attendees this afternoon are people who are thinking about doing mediation freelance. And a couple of you are also looking at setting up in-house mediation services or training mediators internally. So what I want to try and do is to address both of those particular needs, starting off with talking about what mediation actually is. So we have a clear understanding what it is we're talking about. Then to go on to talking about who becomes a mediator. And again, I'll try and keep in mind that we have people who are freelance or intending to be freelance and people who are looking at in-house mediation. So we'll try and cover both those areas. And then looking at where the work is for a mediator, which is rather more relevant to the freelance setting. But uh, let's see what we can do in terms of ideas for how you would pick up referrals within your organization if you were setting up an in-house service. So that's what we're going to be doing for the next 35, 40 minutes. So the next thing then is to talk about mediation, what it is. Um, it's not meditation, uh, contrary to what Yellow Pages believed for a couple of years. And so we went in as UK meditation. So they didn't get paid, but we didn't get many of the right kind of phone calls. So common uh, confusion. And a bit of a shame because it makes people think that it's a soft option or something to do with counselling or, or worse. Um, and uh, myself, coming from a psychotherapy background, I've got a very clear picture about the difference between mediation and therapy and where there's overlap and where there's difference. Uh, it's very definitely not a soft option. It's very definitely nothing to do with meditating. What it is to do with, according to the Law Society's Code of Practice, it's something about having a process where two or more people who are in dispute agree to the appointment of a neutral third party who takes the role of the mediator. So there we have uh, a process which might involve a couple of people or more than a couple. So you can have disputes that would be successfully mediated that might involve three, four, five people. It's not unusual for us working in the NHS or in universities or with emergency services where people work in work groups of five or six. Um, it's not unusual to have disputes among small teams of that size. And the mediation process works very well for team disputes as it does for one-on-one -on -one disputes. So two or more people who have to be in dispute, that's a given. And the people in dispute have to agree to the appointment of a neutral third party. So voluntariness is emphasized. The need for there to be a dispute, for it to be mediation is emphasized. And it can be two people or it can be more than two people. And the mediator, really, their role is to stay impartial. They don't have any authority to tell the parties what to do or to make decisions on their behalf. But the mediator helps people to make their own decisions by getting them talking. So in effect, what we're doing as mediators is helping people to have a better conversation. We're inviting them to come to the table voluntarily, where the mediator is in this impartial position and helps them reach a decision about how to bring their dispute to a close, or if they can't bring it to a close, how to stop it from worsening or being prolonged. And then we uh, have the, the mediator's role is to then leave the parties with that improved dialogue or with that resolved dispute, and then to have no further involvement. So it's a very clean relationship in which the mediator has a very clear role and in which we have quite clear boundaries about confidentiality um, about disclosure of anything that goes on in the mediation sessions and to do with the place where mediation lives within the procedures of the organization. So a lot of work we do with organizations is to do with how to build mediation into policies and procedures, how to make it part of your dignity at work process, um, and how to include mediation as an integral part 
of the, um, the relationship between the employer and employee. So the mediator has a, a role in this regard. The bit I would draw out is the impartial. Impartial is very difficult. And speaking personally as somebody that's been doing this for about 20 years, um, over a thousand mediation cases, if I get it wrong, it's because I lose my impartiality. And it's a very easy thing to do. So as we start to, um, you know, to sort of get further into this idea about becoming a mediator, you might sort of think, well, how could I be impartial in the place where I am, in the role that I have? Am I able to be impartial as a mediator? Just something to bear in mind. Good things about mediation are that people stay in control. Um, you stay in control of the outcome to mediation. It's private. Um, the fact that disclosures from the mediation are limited to minimizing risk or mitigating risk. What happens in the mediation, what gets said and done, remains confidential. Except, of course, you know, if there's any risk of harm or any issues to do with um, child protection or to do with um, laundering proceeds of crime or fraud you know so there are boundaries but generally speaking the content of mediation is kept very private the parties remain in control of what happens most cases take place in a day so workplace mediations between two people would typically be seeing parties individually in the morning and then bringing them together in the afternoon for a joint meeting uh, commercial cases they take a little bit more setting up uh, a little bit of preparation, but essentially the mediation process itself takes place over a day. So mediation is very quick. Um, the exception is working with families who have got conflict within the family and who are trying to keep the family together. This often needs a series of shorter meetings over a period of time. Um, but that's the exception to the rule, which is that most mediation cases take a single day. Consequently, the cost is minimized. So you will get for under a thousand pounds a day's workplace mediation from most providers. Um, few legal firms charge more than that. You may find that if you're looking at solicitors who've gone into mediation, um, they might be charging a more uh, typical fee that they would for legal services. But generally speaking, dedicated mediators, you're looking at for workplace mediation under a thousand pounds, neighborhood mediation, even less than that, commercial mediation, a little bit more than that because of the extra preparation. But relative to the cost of a, uh, a grievance process, a disciplinary or performance process, and certainly relative to the cost of a, an employment tribunal, the cost of mediation is very, very low. And finally, it's a highly productive process. So all of the research I've seen over the years from the UK and beyond would point to a figure of around about 80% success. So four out of five mediation cases will settle um, or get to the point where there's no further action required in relation to that dispute. So there will be a good outcome in round about four out of five mediation cases. So for me, that's a highly productive process. What we all if an agreement is not struck, and sometimes it isn't, what you've done is got the two parties to a place where they're having much better dialogue, where the relationship is more robust, where they're able to talk and they're able to give and take and where they don't need any further intervention from the organization to deal with their working relationship. So even where we can't tick the box and saying, yep, we've got a written agreement, you will often find that the relationships improve to that point where we don't need to give it any further attention. So next question, who becomes a mediator? And again, I'm keeping in mind that we have people here this afternoon who are interested in in-house mediation as well as people who are thinking about taking this up as a freelance occupation. So let's think about the two, those two cases. First of all, the freelance. So here's a bunch of happy people. Um, we've trained housing officers, accountants, counselors, architects, judges. We've trained coaches. We've had doctors on our training courses. We've uh, qualified uh, solicitors to be mediators, trainers, police officers. So just making the point, really, it can be people from any profession, any walk of life, any background. There's no prior experience needed for uh, training as a mediator. Possibly a bit of life experience doesn't go far amiss. And we've also trained very young people to be mediators in schools, mediators within youth, uh, youth services, mediators within organizations um, that work with youngsters uh, under 18. So 
life experience may help. Maybe the maybe the youth may help as well. But we can train anybody. Um, and it's uh, one of the fascinating things about this field is the diversity of people who come into mediation um, and who practice, you know, using their own skills and strengths and personal resources, uh, maybe to bring something different to the party. So anybody can train as a mediator. It might be helpful to think about certain skills and qualities that would dispose you to be able to do mediation. And I would say that the skills, which is the things, these are the things that you do. Um, and it's helpful to be able to have that quick rapport building with people, to be able to get on board with people, to be able to get into a place where they trust you, where they feel like they can work with you, where you have a good working alliance, and to do that quickly. We don't get much time with people in mediation, but being able to establish that rapport quite quickly is a, a real asset. Active listening almost goes without saying, but uh, we do a lot of listening as mediators. It's really helpful for people to be able to tell somebody their story, to have the outpouring, the catharsis, whatever we want to call it, so that they're able to get things off their chest, be able to think more clearly. It's a difficult thing to do when you're angry with somebody to think straight. So some of what we do in the early stages of mediation is help people to offload, give them a good listening to, as I like to say, and the active listening skills come into that. Later on in the mediation process, when we get the two or more people together to have a, a more heated exchange, um, what we'd be looking at doing is keeping good control of that. We need to let them have the sound off between themselves and to have the arguments they need to have. And it's up to us to be assertive, to ensure that that's safe, that it's productive, that both parties get an equal time to speak and that both parties are equally encouraged to listen. So the assertiveness comes into that. So I would say that's some of the skills, possibly more than that, that we could discuss, um, and some of the qualities as well. So qualities for me, it's about how we are. Skills is what you do. Qualities is how you are. And I think the flexibility that we need to bring to the table as mediators is important. People don't address their disputes or conflicts, perhaps in the same way as you or I would address our disputes or conflicts. We need to be flexible and realise that people have got different ways of living their lives, different ways of managing relationships. The impartiality is very important. It's very easy to get hooked in mediation, to be hooked into one person's way of seeing things, to be hooked by the more uh, cooperative party or the more considerate party. Um, it's a very easy thing to do and you find yourself, you've almost got to pinch yourself and think, hold on, um, I'm losing my impartiality here. I feel like I'm taking sides. So it's a really important thing to be able to do. And then the empathy, which is about putting yourself into people's shoes. It's about being able to see from people's frame of reference what's going on for them. Most disputes look to a, an impartial or a detached third party observer, look a bit trivial. So neighbours might be disagreeing about where the fence post goes or two colleagues may be disagreeing at work about the use of certain language or whether the air conditioning's on or the delegation of tasks. To a third party observer, these could look like simple things, easy to resolve. But actually, when you're involved in the conflict, it's far from simple. It goes quite deep. It keeps people awake at night. It's very stressful. It's the first thing on your mind as you come into work each morning is the conflict that you've got with a colleague. So what we need to do is to have this empathy, to be able to see things through people's eyes, understand how how profoundly sometimes the conflict can affect them and then to have the patience to allow them to get to where they need to be in a time scale that they determine not us um, and actually you know have the argument they need and reach the resolution they need at their own pace and in their own way so those are a few things that a mediator would require um, and we move on now perhaps more targeted towards um, the uh, sort of freelance mediators or people who are intending to be freelance to start to discuss uh, where you would find the work as a mediator. So let's take a look at that. In terms of interpersonal mediation, so I'm going to talk about different branches of mediation. So first of all, um, interpersonal mediation is about things to do with workplace, disputes, grievance type issues, disciplinary, um, potentially disciplinary matters, relationship, breakdown, personality clash, allegations of bullying and harassment, 
issues to do with management style or cooperation. These are all the kind of things that you would address within a workplace. That covers a very, very broad uh, group of dispute types. Community and neighbourhood work, interpersonal mediation applies there. Family relationships, trying to keep families together and dealing with complaints. So complaints is the one I'll just say an extra word or two about. I think it's greatly underused and I think within particularly uh, public sector where there are service users who have issues with the quality of care they've received from an NHS trust or the quality of service they've received from their local authority or from the emergency services, what's starting to happen we're finding is that we are mediating a lot more complaint scenarios and it's highly successful. It's a very, very quick way to short circuit a more formal and lengthy process for complaints resolution um, by using a local resolution process, as we'd call it within the health settings, to get to an outcome that both sides can be happy with, where they both feel they've had a chance to speak and to contribute to the resolution process, and where it doesn't feel as if we're getting buried under a mountain of paperwork, a mountain of policies and procedures, and people being defensive um, around what's happened with the situation that's being complained about. So complaints, very... Uh, very relevant and very appropriate application of interpersonal mediation. The second branch of mediation I'll talk about after interpersonal is commercial. Commercial mediation is usually to do with resolving disputes over services or goods. So quite often um, it's things that would otherwise be going through the civil courts process. So your extension wasn't finished, the builder marched off, um, the double glazing fell out, the shirt that you bought from Marks and Spencers, the sleeve fell off, and they're not giving you redress, they're not listening to your complaint, or you're not managing to get it sorted. What we do quite typically is we'll send a letter before action, we will write to them, ring them up, see if we can get satisfaction that way. If we can't, uh, where we go is to court. And now, um, with commercial disputes, uh, it's encouraged through the courts, so the small claims process strongly encourages mediation to try and resolve disputes. Um, and in larger value disputes, we've done some very high value disputes, where people usually have got to the point of impasse, where they're stuck, uh, neither wants to move forward and it's hard to go backwards. Um, that's the point at which mediation tends to, um, to be, uh, become involved. With the commercial claims uh, around complaints where somebody's after compensation, we can also use mediation. And pre-employment tribunal, we're hearing a lot more about this now as well. We're hearing about um, a slightly different process that's on offer, um, which is called pre-claims conciliation. Um, it's a little bit different to mediation for, for quite boring reasons I won't go into. But pre-employment tribunal, if we can catch at the point where somebody is about to submit a tribunal claim um, and do some mediation between that person and their employer and arrive at a settlement agreement, that is a massive, massive saving for both sides. It can also put the claimant in a position where they're more ready to begin alternative employment and it can put the employer in a position where they're more ready to re-recruit or to, um, you know, to sort of clear up after the damage that uh, an, uh, an employment dispute can cause. So pre-employment tribunal, mediation, really good idea. Family mediation, now I don't have a lot to say about this because we don't do it. Um, it's become more of a quasi-legal discipline, it tends to be practiced by family lawyers for couples who are divorcing or separating who want to negotiate their own arrangements. The interesting thing about this, well, I'm sure there's lots of interesting things about it, but one interesting thing is that it's the closest we've got to mandatory mediation. So this thing about legal aid, the, the last bullet point on that slide, is that if you want legal aid now, you need to show that you've been assessed for mediation. And before also, you can go to the point of issuing proceedings um, in the family court. You need to show that you've considered mediation. So the courts not only um, need to know that you've given it a try, but also uh, the LSC won't award you legal aid uh, unless you've had an assessment for mediation. And most people will successfully pass that assessment. It's only if there's been abandonment or domestic violence in some circumstances um, that you won't get legal aid. But the courts are basically saying, use mediation um, unless there's a very good reason not to. So it's the closest we've got in this country, country to mandatory mediation. Other, other than that, it's completely voluntary. 
So those three groups of mediation were interpersonal, commercial, and family. Interpersonal covers the broadest range of application for mediation. So I'll talk about that one first. Workplace disputes, uh, working in housing and neighborhood disputes, and working with families who want to stay together. That's where the work is. Freelancers, these are areas that you, you might want to tackle. People who are thinking about having in-house mediation services. Again, we've worked with a lot of organizations to set up internal workplace mediation services, to look at setting up uh, panels of neighborhood mediators within housing associations and local authorities, um, and also within various third sector organizations have mediators who work with families um, trying to mend relationships, prevent homelessness, and keep families together. So very broad application. The most active and the most frequently used area there is workplace. So interpersonal mediation is mostly applied in the workplace. There's an imperative to get employees working together. The employee, the employer is very happy to pay uh, a modest amount of money to mend the relationship between two employees, get them back to work. Um, it's a, it's the, the cost arguments are very strong. So within an organization was number one, where you've got internal mediators. Number two is about freelance interpersonal mediators. And where we've trained, and we have trained a lot of uh, freelancers who may already be offering um, coaching, HR advice, external HR services, um, debt advice, counseling and therapy, um, all these things which freelancers might have as part of a raft of services they offer. What they do is train as mediators so that they can offer mediation as, as an additional service. It's a very good model. It works quite well. So you have that independence. It's on demand so that the, um, the person drawing down your services only has to pay you when they use you um, compared to the internal uh, mediators of an in-house service. Um, it's a very good model. It works quite well to be a freelance interpersonal mediator, usually doing workplace disputes and sometimes doing complaints type disputes. Freelance commercial mediators is the third one. So this is people who train as commercial mediators who then can provide their services, again, as an independent and on-demand mediator. You'll notice I don't mention internal commercial mediators. That's because it doesn't really work. Um, and supposing I had an issue with, pick a company, Mike, Boots PLC, and something that I wasn't happy with with Boots, and they said, that's okay, you don't need to take us to court because we've got a mediator. So Boots would have their own internal mediator. I wouldn't really trust it. Um, I'd be inclined to think, well, they're going to be batting for Boots PLC. It's not going to be impartial. It's not going to be independent. Um, so it doesn't tend to happen that way. Uh, but what we get is freelance commercial mediators to work with financial and contractual disputes and to offer that impartiality and independence that an in-house mediator would not be able to do. So there's the three areas of work, essentially, um, looking at in-house work or freelance work and looking at the different areas of application um, where you might be able to use your mediation skills. The next point is about how to become a mediator. Um, what do you do? Um, so let's take a look at the steps that are involved in that. So it can be a bit confusing if you've been shopping around. It's hard to know which way to turn really with some of the things that you might have heard. Um, in speaking to people about different levels of accreditation this and registration that and recognition this um, about mediation. We keep it very simple. So let's let's give you a nice simple one, two, three about what you've got to do. First of all, get some training. Um, we'll talk about the characteristics of that training in a moment. Next thing is to get some experience. So the training's great. You get yourself in a position where you're ready to start doing your first few cases. But of course, you have this catch-22 where people want to know that you've got some experience um, before they'll give you cases. But of course, you can't get the experience because you haven't had the cases. And then the credibility. You want to be able to pitch up, um, particularly as a freelance, and to be able to say, you know, um, here's a guy you can trust. I know what I'm doing. There's some backup if things go wrong. Here's the model I work to. Here's my code of practice. So you need to be able to give some kind of a quality stamp Mediation, like a lot of services, there isn't a product you can show to people before they buy it. So they'll only know how good you are when you actually do a case for them. So having that credibility, being able to give some confidence in the mind of your potential consumer 
is a really important thing. And the same applies within house mediators. So um, within a, a local authority or an NHS trust or university or a large private sector employer, uh, the people who are coming to use your services as a mediator, they actually want to know um, that you are credible, that you're trustworthy, that you know what you're doing, that you're properly trained, that there is a process, that there's some backup if things go wrong. Um, they're going to be putting a lot of uh, faith in the mediator. So they want to know that you're a safe pair of hands and you're going to handle it well. So the credibility counts just as much if you're working in-house as it does if you're working as a freelancer. So let's go into thinking about the um, training that we can offer. And this is the bit where I sound a bit like a salesman, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, but look for courses that have accreditation and that there is some external regulation and quality control. It's very easy to wake up one morning, decide you're a mediation trainer and to train people in mediation. But what you need is this external scrutiny. This is what we've gone for for the last 19, 20 years or so, is to allow all of our processes to be externally regulated and scrutinized by an accrediting body. So we're accredited through a local accrediting body onto, onto the Ofqual qualification framework. Ofqual's the regulating body for examinations in England and Wales. They have a qualifications and credit framework. That's what the QCF is there, qualifications and credit framework. And our qualifications are at level four on that qualification and credit framework. So there's an externally regulated, externally accredited way that we can quote um, exactly what the level of the course is, the duration and the number of learning units on the course. Um, and our level is level four, which you'll find is just about one above an A level in terms of complexity. So training as a mediator is that kind of complexity of training one above a, a level, around about first year of an undergraduate degree. So straight away, you know, you, you see that there's a need to be able to quote figures like this. It's more than just um, people dreaming up mediation courses. We have put a lot of store by getting this external accreditation, external regulation. We've developed courses which are separate for interpersonal and for commercial mediation. <clears throat> the two models are quite different. So what we do with interpersonal mediation which is largely based on improving a relationship, um, is we tend to get people together across the table and to have a robust dialogue. With commercial disputes, it's more about reaching a figure, about what number to write on the check um, to reach a financial or commercial settlement. So it tends to be people attending with legal representatives and working in separate rooms and the mediator shuttling between the two rooms um, and getting to the point where you can agree a, a settlement figure usually. So those two processes are quite different and it would get confusing if you were to train on both of those at once. So we tend to keep those separate courses. Um, people who are wanting to go into the subject in a big way might want to train in interpersonal mediation and then do one of our conversion courses to be able also to do commercial disputes. So we don't expect you to go back to zero and start all over again. So we offer shorter conversion courses. We've got all the recognition for CPD points. Um, courses are recognised beyond the UK as well. Uh, we conform to the European Union Code of Practice for Mediators. So basically, if there's a rubber stamp, we've got it. Um, the la last thing there is about in-house training packages. So we have specialised over the last 19 years in setting up packages within organisations so that you get everything you need to be able to hit the ground running after you've done the training and be able to take on your first cases. We can help with templates for paperwork, policies and procedures, how to build mediation into your current practices, as well as helping with mundane things like referral forms and agreement forms and so on. So what we do is we can begin by helping you to select your trainees with a competence-based selection process right through into designing the training to suit your precise need, providing the training, the assessment, and the certification of your mediators, and then through into helping you get your first few referrals, and then to do uh, even case supervision, so running supervision groups for your mediators internally, so that they can bring along the war stories of the first cases they've done, check that they're on track, get some feedback, network with the other mediators within the organization. So basically a lot to help you to set up a, a service internally. Uh, we do a lot more than just train you. 
So then back to the non-salesy bits, really talking about how you get experience when you've done your training as a mediator. So I'll speak separately about in-house mediation services and then about freelance mediators. So the first one there is once you've done your training, what do you do? Well, we need with internal mediation services, what we found over the years is that the ones that work the best are those where you really promote and publicize the service. People have got to know the service exists, what it's for, what it isn't for, and whether you're offering neighborhood mediation or workplace mediation within your uh, organization, you've got to make sure people understand it and understand it quite clearly so they, so they get what the mediation service is for. It's good to use your allies within the organization, so work with your trades unions, work with your staff associations, get senior management buy-in so that mediation becomes a normal thing to do within your organization. Really good idea in that regard to appoint a mediation champion. So if you're setting up mediation in-house, if there is um, a single figure, an, in, uh, an identifiable individual who champions mediation and who chews people's ears at the senior management team meetings, who puts it out there at your, your fairs and your induction processes, um, somebody who can champion mediation and get people to use it on the presumption that we find that works, which is for most workplace disputes, mediation is worth trying unless there's a good reason not to. So what we've tried to do with that is to turn it around. So you don't, you're not using mediation as a last resort or just as a personal person leaves the organization, but rather use mediation first. And uh, a champion can bang that drum and can get that message across um, day by day, week by week, so that people get used to this idea of using mediation. And again, down the same line, run awareness raising events. We can help. What we can do um, if we come and train your mediators internally is we're very happy to give you some materials and schemes of work so that you can run half day or one day workshops for your people. Help to educate your organization and key players in your organization what mediation is all about by running some awareness raising events internally, hear people's questions and concerns, get the information out there so that they know what to refer and when to refer it. We encourage co-mediation, people working together. It's a great way to get experience once you've trained. And again, with a lot of in-house services, we would suggest you start off by working in twos, uh, work with a co-mediating pair. Um, and case supervision is the last one there. It's about a place to come along and to present your work, to present cases that you've done, to talk with other mediators about what you did, what you tried, what worked, what didn't. And we provide a supervisor, um, an expert supervisor to come along, run those groups for you um, and to give the feedback and look at how you can continually improve your practice so that you get an excellent in-house mediation service. So post training, those are the kind of things we would suggest you do. And not least is to evaluate your service. Again, we can help with that. We can help you know which questions to ask and what aspects of your mediation service to look at. So you can prove um, your return on training investment, really, by getting the evaluations. Freelance mediators, you're more out, on the, uh, out there on your own. So what I suggest you do is if you've already got connections within a certain industry sector, is to exploit those connections. So if you've worked in uh, accountancy for 20 years and you're deciding to train as a mediator, look to the accountancy industry. Do you have connections there? You would probably have expertise and be able to speak the language. I, I'd use those as the lines of least resistance. Look at exploiting those connections. Where can you get mediation in the accountancy industry? Um, go down that road. Offer a few free cases. I mentioned earlier, you know, that there's not a product to show people with mediation. People only know that you're any good when you actually do a case. So why not do a case or two for free um, and see you know, if you can do a good job and convince somebody that what you've got is a great idea, they're more likely to buy your services in the future. Definitely need a website. Don't need to say much about that. Again, co-mediation can be good. Can you buddy up with a more experienced mediator when you get started? Can you uh, do some co-mediation with someone who's maybe worked in the sector that you're looking to work at? Uh, again, you can offer your services for free. Do some co-mediation, great place to develop your skills, to try things out, to get some feedback. Um, and the last point there, slightly cryptic, is about promoting mediation and marketing yourself. So if you're investing in mediation training, you're hoping to get set up as a mediator. If you can get two cases, you've paid for your training. But 
Um, you don't just want to market yourself as the, the mediator of choice, but I think there's a, still a job to be done about awareness raising around mediation. A lot of people don't know what it is. A lot of employers, um, people in lots of industry sectors are not quite sure what mediation is. So you may find that you're having to promote mediation in a non-profit making way at the same time as marketing yourself as a practitioner in a more profit making way. So be prepared for that. And then the third bit was about establishing credibility. So I mentioned about training, then I talked about gaining experience, and now I'm just going to mention about establishing credibility. So both within house services and with freelance mediators, you are coming across people who are in dispute who maybe never used mediation before, and they're looking at you and wondering, well, what can this guy do? You know, what can she or he offer? Um, that I couldn't do for myself or that my HR department or my solicitor or my trade union rep couldn't do for me. What's this mediator got? Um, and I think it's important for all of the things that you can do to try and establish that trust. It's important to um, find any way you can to be able to convince people that you've actually got something to offer, that you're trustworthy, that you've got a code of practice behind you, that you are working to a particular model, that you've got some accredited training, um, that you're you're working on the basis of. It's about proving your integrity and your accountability. They know what to do if something goes wrong. They know that what you're doing is mediation and not something else. Um, as you progress in that, we very much plug the idea of case supervision and doing continuing professional development activity. So for people who want to work as mediators with a capital M and do this properly, um, you know, we're looking at being able to prove your mettle and doing case supervision in CPD to keep your hand in and to keep up to date with developments in the field and also to prove that you are continually, continually developing as a mediator. Very, very important and something that I've emphasised um, a lot over the years. You're building trust and reputation. It's about people coming to you a second time. It's about people saying, OK, that guy was good. I'll go back to him or her and have a second case. So there we are in, in a one rather long breath, that's how you become a mediator. So at the end of all of that, you're a mediator. Um, you're looking at doing the right kind of training. You're looking at getting some experience. You're looking at gaining credibility. I've talked about the different branches of mediation, um, the different ways we would compare uh, how you would work as a freelancer um, compared with working as an internal in-house mediator. So what I would say about this profession, having done this for quite a while, is it's certainly challenging. Um, you get to uh, come across some very interesting situations. It's quite varied. It's frustrating sometimes. It's always fascinating to see how people get stuck in their conflict and how they can be supported to move on using the skills that we have as mediators. Um, it's a profession that I enjoy. And it's a profession we've trained over 4,500 mediators in the last X years. Um, and I love to hear people's stories. They come back to us. They say, hey, I'm working in this area. I'm working in that area. I got a postcard from somebody only yesterday. Um, she works in publishing and she was looking at going into mediation in the publishing industry. Um, and I just heard from her recently now, she's taken on two more practitioners to work with her. She's found a real niche and obviously doing it very well. Uh, somebody that trained with us years ago. So th these are great stories to gather up. It is growing. It has grown over the last uh, 15, 20 years, um, partly with slight legislative pushes um, with people being encouraged more to try mediation. There's a slight encouragement from the courts. There's encouragement through the Employment Tribunal and uh, best practice in the workplace. There's encouragement through the family um, court process as well. Um, so it has grown, and I think it's likely to grow further. So there are opportunities there. What I would say is you need to go out and find them. You know, the work is there, but you do need to go and find it. Um, and for in-house mediation services, you know, there's a few things I've said there about championing, um, and about setting up the right policies and procedures and doing your internal PR. If you do that, you will get cases as a mediator. So I say good luck to you. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking at my timings there. Amazingly, I've done 40 minutes, which is um, about 10 less than I usually do when I say I'm going to do 40 minutes. Um, do keep in touch with us. It's a delight to have you along here this afternoon. We've got a, uh, a website at the top there. You can follow us on Twitter. I strongly encourage that. We, uh, we've got a very active uh, Twitter feed. You can find some interesting stuff on there. Have a look at what we've got on Facebook. 
um, or give us a call. We've got a branch where I am this afternoon in the East Midlands in Belpa, um, and we've got a London branch as well. Um, and you're very welcome to call us on either of those places and we'll see what we can do for you.